Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our daily devotions with Pastor Sutton on this Saturday. It is. It's Saturday. Saturday, the 4th of March, the only day in the year that gives a command, March 4th. Um, and I've been up since 6. I've, uh, I, uh, wasn't sleeping, so I just got up. And then, uh, the, uh, snowblower that I've been working on and off. I still had to put a few pieces in it, so I went and did that before I came and saw you guys, and so uh, here I am now, um, Saturday morning, just kind of doing my thing. So glad you're here with us to spend a little time in God's Word on this Saturday morning. Um, this play went off well last night, I thought. I mean, they were a few things here and there that they struggled with, but overall they did really good, especially when you take into account that it was the uh, the first formal run-through of it since they finished their practices. I moved this a little bit ago, and it seems to... There, well, that's bad. Moved a little bit on me. Um, so, yeah, so his play was good. And, and uh, tonight they do it again at 7 o'clock, and tomorrow at 2. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. Family coming today. My dad's coming to see the play tonight, and uh, I think uh, Zan's Uncle Glenn will be here, Aunt Laurel, and so they can go to it today. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good day. It's going to be a good, a busy day. But we begin it here in the Lord's Word to give us the you know, strength and confidence to, to do that, and it's, I mean, it's kind of overcast today, though, kind of, um, and, uh, but you know what, that's okay. It's, it's bright. Well, I don't know. It's kind of filtered bright, you know. Uh, it's not the bright, bright, warm, warm orange sunlight. But, you know. uh, but you know, when we when we get into the first weeks of March, I, I think, you know, there's only six weeks maybe of winter left. When I lived in, in the La Crosse area, down south of La Crosse and Westby, I, 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 I kind of figured that around this time of year there was about a month left and by the by the end of March 1st of April we'd start to see although there could be snow and the cold weather still um, it wouldn't be it wouldn't last um, and certainly by the time May rolls around it was it was spring but up here everything's two or three weeks later so even though I'm sitting here thinking well we could be could be having some spring weather here pretty quick um, the truth is probably more like eight weeks instead of six weeks but uh, so good morning. Glad you're here with us. Let's uh, let's see who who is here uh, with us on this Saturday morning uh, as we're getting things going here. I got to refresh here because it was I mean, Facebook was doing some really weird stuff when I was setting up this morning. Wouldn't let me pull the history uh, of the other videos in to just because what I, what I sometimes do is I'll reuse the previous day's picture and information and stuff and then just go in and edit um, the day and, and what the what the other information is. It wouldn't do it. It wouldn't it wouldn't pull it in. I'd I'd click the button to reuse the old data and it and it and it just would spin. Sit there and look at me. And I and I rebooted and I cleared my history and cache on, on my uh, web browser and half a dozen other things I tried. Ran a few updates, rebooted again and it still wouldn't go. So I had to do everything Old school today, manually. Hey, Ken, good morning to you. Thank you again for the wishes. Geraldine and Neil, good morning to you. Jeannie and Bob, good morning. Thank you. Didn't get much of a storm last night. Well, that's okay. Right? That's not a bad thing. You don't have to have a storm. I know we had uh, a couple of these snows that have come through. They were nothing to speak of, so, you know, be glad. Less snow to remove. Jill and John, good morning to you guys. There's Ann and Deb and Grant, good morning there. And uh, Renee, good morning. Out shoveling snow, so a little, well, that's okay. I'm a little slow in getting moving here, too, so don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So good morning. Glad you're all here with us on this on this Saturday morning here to spend a little time in Lord in the Lord's Word. Let's, um, oh. Yeah, let's go ahead and get right into this. Uh, if you have the uh, Lutheran Service Book, page 295, Daily Prayer for Individuals and Families, the Morning Order. As always, I have my 
treasury of daily prayer right here. Someday we might do something different, but it is kind of easy just to pull this book down off the shelf and do what's in it instead of having to recreate the wheel. And I'll tell you what, I have found here in the season of Lent that I have done a, an excellent job of, of over-promising and under-delivering. Under I, I usually shoot to under-promise and over-deliver, um, but I really back myself up against the wall on a few things this season. Um, and I knew better, but, you know, the Lord will get you through. All right. So, morning order, let's uh, let's get down to the brass tacks here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise, and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm today, Psalm uh, 32, verses 1 through 5. Psalm 32, 1 through 5. Oh, okay. All right. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away my, through, through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is King David writing. Psalm 51 is the psalm that uh, David most likely wrote right after the incidents of Bathsheba and um, or Bathsheba and uh, Uriah, uh, that that great sin of adultery and murder uh, that David had. Um, but I think I think Psalm 30, uh, 32 is is also part of that, right? Because when you've done when you when you've sinned, when you've done something that is that you know is wrong. Um, be it uh, uh, be it a, a, a sin of action or inaction, um, those things which we do or those things which we don't realize we've done. Um, you, it hurts inside. You know, um, there's when people have done wrong and they know they've done wrong and their conscience is working to remind them of that they become angry and bitter if they don't believe that they've done something wrong, if they hide their sins. Um, and we see that. We see that bitterness in people. Uh, but blessed is the one who's, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. When, when you confess your sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive them. Um, and, and David says, when, when he held his sin in, right? When I kept silent, my bones wasted away my, by my groaning, uh, through my groaning all day long, right? Um, I don't feel good, right? And, and that, that sin eats away at the inside. My bones wasted away. Um, but when I, I uh, acknowledge my sin to you, when I confess my sins to the Lord, when I do not cover my iniquity, um, the Lord forgives, and I, I, you are healed. That's what Christ came for, is to, is to heal, right? But it's not the, the healing of the body, it's the healing of the, of the Spirit, and to bring eternal life uh, through that, through that uh, healing that comes by His blood shed upon the cross. Let's go on to our, our reading for today. Hey, I see, uh, I did an update here. Bonnie, Bonnie rolled in here to tell us that, oh, it's, it is 27 degrees. All right, well, you know, that's, that's right. And um, 
uh, Kyle, oh, and, and Ray popped in with a happy birthday. Thank you. Connie and Robin are here. Good morning to you guys. Kathy, good morning. Shoveling snow as well, huh? And Jerry, good morning. Um, yeah, good morning all. Our, our reading today, Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Um, oh, this is, okay. This is two signs, miracles, whatever you want to call them, but signs, um, that occur uh, sort of meshed together. And this, is, this is a passage that's always kind of intrigued me, the way they mesh. So remember, we just left the demoniac of the Gerasenes in uh, 520. And now we pick up with verse 21 of chapter 5. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, Do you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, interesting. So you've got Jairus at the beginning and Jairus and his daughter at the end. And you've got the woman in the middle. And, and what, is, uh, what, is the, uh, what is going on here? Well, the, the faith of these people, the trust of, of Jairus and of um, the woman, that, that Jesus has the authority to do these things, um, is essential. Now, it is not their faith that causes these things to happen, but we know that it is faith that clings to the promises of Christ. The gifts of God are received by faith. Okay? Um, I've often used the analogy of a trick-or-treat bag. Right? 
the, 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 when, when, when children go, children, when people, should be children, but people go trick or treating on Halloween, all Hallow's Eve, um, and they take a bag to collect the candy, right? Um, the bag is, can be compared to faith. If you go to the house and you knock on the door and you say trick or treat, and you hold out the bag and the master of the house comes and, and has a gift to give you, candy, and drops it, the bag holds it. The bag receives it. The bag contains it. But if you don't have the bag, the, the, the gift falls to the ground and is nothing. The grace of God in Christ Jesus is plentiful. It, it flows day and night, hour by hour, minute by minute, out into the world uh, for people to receive. It's there. It's ever-present. Um, but you don't receive it by reason, and you don't receive it by will. It is received by faith. And so if one who, is, who does not believe, one who is unfaithful, um, cannot receive the gift, right? the gift of grace and mercy from Christ Jesus, from God. But one who is faithful receives that gift by the faith that they have. And so, so Jairus comes, he's a, a leader of the synagogue, he's a ruler of the synagogue, he's an important man in this village. And I, I, uh, I don't, we don't know exactly what town Jesus is in by this text. I want to say he's in Capernaum um, based on other texts, but I'm not sure. And it really doesn't matter. But this, he's not in Jerusalem with the temple. This is a leader of the synagogue, which is the, the outlined places of worship, the gathering places, churches, if you wish to use the word. But you would only use that word because they are called ecclesia, where they gather in the synagogues. It's an ecclesia, it's a gathering. Um, an assembly. Anywho, uh, he has heard of the things that Jesus has done. And whether he believes it because Jesus is sent from God, or he believes it because the authority is in the world, uh, he, he regardless, he believes it. And he asked Jesus to come and help her da his daughter, who is, who is terribly ill. Lay your hands on her, and she will live. And so Jesus goes with him, right? Jesus' compassion is exceeds all things, and, and he desires to to help those who who, who call upon him and, and who believe in him. And as he's going, the woman comes, and, and the woman, her her faith, her trust, her belief in Christ to make her well is so strong that she thinks, if I can just touch the tassels on his garment. I don't have to, he doesn't even have to spend any time with me. I just, I just touch that which is touching him. And she is, she does and she is, she's healed. And she feels it in her body, right? Uh, her sin cause was causing her bones to waste away. But when she touched him, she's made well, she's healed. Jesus says, who did this? Well, now, According to his human nature, he may not know, but according to his divine nature, he absolutely knows, right? Omnipotent, omniscient, he knows all things, sees all things, he's in all places. Um, but for the purpose of teaching, who touched me? And the disciples, well, what do you mean, who touched you? If this is a crowd, you know, the, the roadways are narrow, and the people are crushed in around him. There's thousands following him. So he looks around to see, and the woman steps forth, and and worships him, kneels before him and tells him the whole truth, and he forgives her again, right? Uh, told him the whole truth, and he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, be healed of your disease. Right? Your faith has made you well. The, 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 the faith that you have gives you the ability to receive the forgiveness of sins, the promise of everlasting life, and for her, physical healing. Without the faith, she couldn't. Your faith has made you well. Um, it's not, it's, it, 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 it's a receiving, not a giving, right? Everything we do in our worship in our church is about receiving. 
God's grace. We, and then returning thanks. But until we receive, we have nothing to give. What is in us but fallen nature and sinful, uh, sinful desires? We have nothing to give. But then Christ gives us forgiveness and grace and mercy. And we are healed, made clean. And then we can return thanks. Thanks be to God. Right? And as he's still speaking, some of the Jairus' servants come up and say, don't bother the teacher anymore, the girl's dead. It's all over. Never mind. Go home. And Jesus says, don't be, do not fear. Only believe. Whatever the situation is, whatever the difficulty is, don't be afraid. Trust in Christ. Trust in God. <laughs> believe in the Father. Believe also in me, he says in John chapter 7. Uh, John, in John's gospel. I don't remember what chapter. And, and so they go. And he gets to the house. And, of course, the tradition of the, the, tradition of the Jews this is the ruler of the synagogue, so he's a prominent person. But the tra tradition of the Jews when somebody has died is they have mourners that come and wail and cry and uh, make, a, make a show. And, and Jesus said, what are you doing? She's only asleep. They mock him. They laugh at him. But he drives everybody from the house and takes the, the little girl's father, Jairus, and, his, and her mother, and James and, and uh, Peter and, and uh, John, the inner circle, up into the room with him. And there he touches the child. He, he reaches out, taking her by the hand, reaches out, reaches out, takes her hand, says, Talitha Kumi, little girl, rise. And it's resur resurrection language. This is, this is the language of the risen Christ. Right? This isn't get up. This is be raised. And immediately, not slowly, not, you know, immediately she rises from her bed and began walking. She began doing the things that a, a little girl of 12 years of age would do, as if nothing had ever been wrong. But you know what? She's been laying here sick. She's hungry. So Jesus charged them, don't tell anybody what happened here. Of course, they will. They can't not. But give her something to eat. She's hungry. She's hungry. And Jesus knows it. Your Heavenly Father knows the things you need before you even ask for them. He knows she's hungry. Give her something to eat. When I hid my iniquity, my bones melted within me. I suffered in agony. But when I acknowledged them and you forgave them, I am made well as if nothing had ever been wrong. In the forgiveness of sins, I believe it's another psalm, says, they are as far from the east as is from the west. Your sin is gone. And your faith makes you well. Take eat. Take drink. Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And your faith, and faith alone, receives the promise that's in with and under the bread and wine that is the body and blood of Christ. And in receiving it, your sin is forgiven. You are fed. You are made whole again. And you are healed again. By the grace of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's look at our prayer of the day, and then we'll go on to our Lenten catechesis. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, during this earthly ministry, his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacrament, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we move into our Latin, Latin catechesis now, the ninth and tenth commandments. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. According to the last two commandments, no one should consider or intend to get what belongs to another, such as his wife, servants, house, and estate, land, meadows, cattle. He should not take them even with a show of right, 
by a trick or to his neighbor's harm. Here it is also forbidden for you to alienate anything from your neighbor, even though you could do so with honor in the eyes of the world, so that no one could accuse or blame you as though you had gotten it wrong for it. We must know that God does not want you to deprive your neighbor of anything that belongs to him, so that he suffer the loss and you gratify your greed with it. If it is not called stealing and cheating, it is still called coveting your neighbor's property. That is, aiming at possession of it, luring it away from him without his consent, and being unwilling to see him enjoy what God had granted to him. Even though the judge and everyone must let you keep it, God will not let you keep it. Now, we have the Ten Commandments, a summary of the divine teaching about what we are to do in order that our whole life may be pleasing to God. Everything that is to be a good work must arise and flow from and in this true fountain and channel. So apart from the Ten Commandments, no work or thing can be good or pleasing to God, no matter how great or precious it is in the world's eyes. God demands that all our works proceed from the heart, a heart that fears and regards God alone. From such fear, the heart avoids everything that is contrary to his will, lest it should move him to wrath. And on the other hand, the heart also trusts in him alone, and from love for him does all he wants. For he speaks to us as a friend, as, as friendly as a father, and offers us all grace and every good. So, in Catechesis, Ninth and Tenth Commandments, uh, from the Large Catechism. Yeah, you can go read in First Samuel, the Second Samuel, I think it is, about King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and Naboth and his vineyard, and that'll give you a uh, a view of what the result of coveting is. All right, let us continue then with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we are bold to pray as our Lord taught us, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our prayers for ourselves and others on this Saturday morning. Let me grab my prayer list down here. Let us pray. I lay down and slept... I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. Protected by your mighty hand, I have passed the night, Lord. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies that you have shown to me. As I thank you for the, all the gracious protection, I think of all those who are in sorrow, in tribulation, in sickness, and poverty, in shame, in anguish of soul. Especially this day, in our hearts and minds, are those who have asked for our prayers. Pat, Lois, Anne... Brianne, Rose, Bob, Mike, Megan, Dan, Ezra, Neely, Jeremy, Ashley, John, uh, Renee, Shazad, Holden, Shar, and all who call upon your most holy name. I beseech you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, to comfort my brothers and sisters with the assurance of your unchanging grace and loving kindness. Strengthen their faith. Preserve them from misbelief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Teach them to humble themselves under your mighty hand by recognizing your gracious purpose to work through tribulation, patience, 
through patience, experience, through experience, hope, that will not make them ashamed. Help all sufferers to best their trials until you, at last your kingdom comes. Deliver us all from every evil work and preserve us unto your heavenly kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings, all our doings, may be preserved from sin. Our life sanctified and our work this day be well-pleasing to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, who kept me this night from all harm and danger. I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Well, friends, that concludes our daily devotions for today. Hey, Neely, good morning to you, my dear friend. And uh, uh, Mushtak, uh, good morning. Well, you're not, trained, you're not joining late. And Debbie, good morning again. And, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, hey, God's peace be with you. We'll see you back here on Monday morning for our, uh, our time together in God's Word, our daily devotions. In the meantime, tomorrow, Sunday, go to church. Consider that a command. Not a law, but a gift. God's peace be with you, and we'll see you back here on Monday for our daily devotions.